And I'll ask you to turn to the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Uh, I don't preach from this book very often, but there's a lot in here that I, that I really like. I'm only going to try to get one verse out to you. I'm, y'all pardon me, I've got to loosen that tie already. Um, I'm going to be in chapter 4. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. And if you find your place, or as you find your place, we'll ask you to rise. We're just going to read the first verse. And the first verse, the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, reads, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Lord, this evening we do ask you uh, to be with us in the reading and the understanding of the Word. Help us, Lord, that we might uh, know, Lord, that your voice, as we hear it through the Word, that we might hear you speaking with us. I ask you this in your name, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I know that sounds like I just pulled out a random verse, doesn't it? Uh, But there's something in there. Uh, I want you to get this. You see, the Song of Solomon is uh, literally... It was a song between Solomon and Shunammite woman. Uh, And so it's a love song. It's a love ballad back and forth. And sometimes it's Solomon uh, speaking to this woman. And sometimes it's her speaking to Solomon. Well, what it is, uh, if you look at it by type, it's Christ in the church. It's Christ speaking to the church. And the church speaking back to Christ. There's a love... uh, there's the blossoming and blooming between the two. You know, there's a deep love between Christ and the church. We love Christ, and Christ loves the church. And that's what this is about. Here in, in chapter 4, in this first verse where you see this, this is Solomon speaking. So if you will, this is Christ speaking to the church. And he's describing uh, to the church why she's beautiful. Now, just hold with me for a minute because uh, you might not see that just yet. You will. Uh, and you know, every man at some time in his life has probably tried or should have somewhere to try to tell some woman why he thinks she's beautiful. Now, men, you know good and well that none of us are very good at it. Uh, But every man tries to, at some point, tell a woman why he thinks she's beautiful. And and I'll, I'll ask you this, ladies. When a man does that, does he not have your full attention? No matter how much he stumbles and and can't get the words out, he has your full attention. So I think that we as the church should listen here as Christ tells the church of the beauty that he sees in the church. Because that's what's going on. Did I mention to you, by the way, that Jesus loves you? Did I mention to you that Jesus loves the church? Loves the church. Gave himself for it. He has a deeper love than we have. Oh, we'd like to think of how deep we love Christ. But he has a deeper love than we have. And he's here telling, telling the church of his love for the church and describing the beauty. The very first thing he says, he says, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. He says this twice. Twice. Now, I know that I've mentioned this before, how that anything is repeated in the Bible is of double importance, how that he's, he's, he's certifying and testifying, I'm saying this and I, I mean this. Not that Christ ever says anything he doesn't mean, but he's just doubling up on it. He says, thou art fair, thou art fair. Now, I need to explain to you what's going on on this. See, this Shunammite woman had already expressed some self-doubts had already come out in the first chapter. Let let me look at the first chapter. Well, before I even go to the first chapter, let me tell you what's the the importance of this thing about being fair. Uh, You see, in our our lifetime, and going back into the 20th century even, uh, we've seen people go out, and when they, to look better, we've seen them go out and suntan. Right? That was really big when I was a kid. Uh, But that was not so up until the 20th century. Uh, A woman who had dark skin was considered common. I'm just talking about, I'm not, regardless of race, I'm just talking about somebody who worked out in the sun was considered common. That would be just any old working woman or peasant woman. But the the, the real ladies of society uh, didn't have a suntan. They would have very fair, very light skin. 
As a matter of fact, the first makeup that you ever see happen in Western society was women putting white powder on them, even using mercury to turn their skin white. See, fair skin, fair skin was considered a sign of beauty. Are you following me now? It's considered a sign of beauty. Look at the first chapter, though, when the Shunammite woman was showing doubts about herself. Uh, in in uh, verse 5 and 6, said, I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. She wasn't talking about literally black on her skin. She was talking about being dark. She was talking about being suntanned uh, from being a worker out in the fields. Look in the next verse and it explains it. It says, Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry at me. They made me keeper of the vineyard. See, they made her work out in the sun. She she was just considered a common woman, just an everyday person that had to go out and work and labor in the sun. And she didn't think of herself as being all that fair. Didn't think of herself as being all that beautiful. Are you following me? And so here, Solomon's telling the Shunammite woman, or I could say Christ is telling the church, thou art fair. And it says it again, thou art fair. You know, we don't think too much of ourselves, or we shouldn't, anyhow. Sometimes when we start thinking of how the Lord loves us, we think, well, I certainly don't deserve it. And it's got nothing to do with what we deserve. It's got to do with the fact that He loves us. Uh, and we think of ourselves, but I'm just common. I, I'm not anything above anybody else. Uh, and we're not. Uh, and we think there's no reason for Christ to love me. There's no reason for Christ to look at us and think, that we're any better than anybody else. Uh, And by the way, that's the proper attitude to have. That's right. But Christ is reassuring the church here. He says, thou art fair. He says that there's something in you that he likes, that he loves, that he considers beautiful. As beautiful as anybody out there. As a matter of fact, he considers his church to be beautiful above every person in the world. How about that? Thou art fair, he says. My love. And that's in the middle of those two statements. Thou art fair, thou art fair. But oh no, right in the middle of it, he makes sure that you know who he's talking to. My love. Because Christ loves the church. Loves the church. You know, if a man really loves a woman, it says a whole lot. If a man really does love a woman, uh, there's there's nothing he won't do for her. He'll give of himself. He'll give of his time. He'll give. He'll make sacrifices. Uh, he'll he'll be glad. He'll sacrifice his health. He'll sacrifice his wealth. He'll sacrifice anything he has if he really loves a woman. And, and you know, Christ sacrificed all for us. Left heaven itself. We, even, we don't even know what riches are. We, we think we know what riches are, but He left the riches of heaven itself. Uh, not just to come down and, and live and die, but to die a horribly cruel death. Uh, to die the worst death possible for us. No man has ever given for his woman like Christ gave for the church. He's got a love that far surpasses the love of a man for a woman. Though a man may love a woman with everything thing he has in her. It's nothing compared to how Christ loves the church. He says, thou art fair, my love. Thou art fair. There's a lot in that. Well, he sees a beauty in the church. There's a beauty that he sees. Have you ever wondered what that beauty is? You know, it says that we should worship him in the beauty of holiness. And not having a right understanding of holiness makes people not understand what that means. The word holy means set apart. Set apart. You know, a man that's in love with a woman would like to take her and set her apart for himself. So that nobody else could hurt her. So that nobody else could do anything wrong to her. And keep her apart and protect her for himself. Holiness means separation. And we have sometimes a bad idea of that or a bad understanding of that. To be separated unto God means to be separated from the pain of this earth, separated from the wrong that this world would do us, separated unto the love of God. Now, I hope that makes a little better sense to you. That's what holiness really means. There's more to it than just how you speak and how you look and everything else. I understand those things are outward signs 
of holiness. But holiness is to be separated to the love of God and away from the hurt and the harm of a foul and evil earth. Uh, and this world itself that's out to defile, to defile, to defile. To be separated from that. You know, a man doesn't want his woman uh, defiled by the, the men around. There's a reason why a good man is a jealous man. And that's right, by the way. Any man that's not jealous isn't worth a plug nickel. Uh, a man's jealous of his woman not because he doesn't trust that woman, but because he doesn't trust the other men. And our God's a jealous God. He's jealous of us because He knows that this world would defile us if it can. He says, Thou art fair, my love. Thou art fair. It's that beauty of holiness that He sees being separated unto Him. It says, Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Now I want to preach on this for just a moment. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. You'll, you'll understand what He's talking about. He's looking at her eyes within thy locks, within your hair. He says, You have dove's eyes. Now, a dove is interesting anyhow. You see, a dove, out of all the birds that God made, the dove, sometimes it's called a turtle dove, the dove is the only bird that was considered clean to be used as a sacrifice. Generally speaking, you'll find that the birds in the Scriptures are a picture of evil. Uh, As a matter of fact, they're often a picture of evil spirits. Uh, In in Revelation, when it speaks of Babylon falling and all that, in Revelation chapter 18, uh, John was writing and said, After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen. So here's another thing repeated. And it has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. What do birds have to do with it? I'm telling you, birds are usually a picture of evil when you see them in the Scriptures. They're used for a picture of evil spirits and so forth. In Matthew, when our Lord was uh, uh, giving a parable about the kingdom of heaven, and He talked about the mustard seed, He said uh, in Matthew, and I'll give you the reference, it's chapter 13, verse 31, says another parable put He forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it's grown, is the greatest among herbs, herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. What's he talking about? He's talking about how at the very end of the church age, there'll be evil that'll come and get in amongst the church. See, the birds are usually, are almost always, a picture of evil. But not the dove. Not the dove. See, the dove is different from the other birds. And Jesus says, or Christ says here, that His church is different from all the others. For man may be evil. I mean, after all, we read in Genesis how God recognized that uh, the imaginations of man's heart were evil from his youth. Only evil continually. He says, though the world be evil, his church, see, it's like a dove. It's different from all the others. You begin to see the love of Christ in this? He says, thou hast dove's eyes. That dove is different from the other birds. You know, there's one way that a bird, that a dove is different, is in the fact that a dove is monogamous. Now, you, if you want to know what that means, that means it mates for life to one. It doesn't go off looking for a different dove every time. But it stays with one. You see, when we're joined to Christ, we don't go looking for other gods. But we stay with one. That's what Christ is looking for. That's why we're compared there to a dove. He talks about dove's eyes. Dove's eyes. You know, a dove doesn't have a loud, shrill song. But a dove has a soothing, a calm, a soothing, and an humble song. You ever heard the doves? Sounds almost like they're crying, doesn't it? A mournful song. And the Lord recognizes that in His people. How that our song is not boastful and proud. Not, not, we're, not the church 
that Christ loves. But it's soft and it's soothing. It's even mournful looking at the wickedness of this world. But he didn't just say there's a dove in your ox. He said thou hast dove's eyes. See, the eyes are the window of the soul, it's often said. The eyes. You can tell a lot about a person from their eyes. You can see in people's eyes sometimes whether or not they're a deceiver. You can tell in people's eyes. He said thou hast dove's eyes. Uh, You know, the dove is a type of the Spirit oftentimes in the Scriptures. Remember how that when Jesus was baptized, it was a dove that descended from heaven and landed on him? Remember when we talked about the ark, how that when, uh, almost called him Moses, how that Noah let out the raven and the dove? uh, And we said that the raven was a type of the flesh, but the dove a type of the spirit. The dove is often a type of the spirit. He sees within us in in that window of our soul, in the eyes, the spirit of God. How about that? Thou hast dove's eyes. That's the reason why the church is loved of Christ. There's the spirit that's within us. There's dove's eyes. You know, the dove's eyes are also mournful. You know, I remember Brother Ronald, you was talking about how a dove, when it dies, will have a tear in its eye. Uh, a dove's eyes are, are big and round and dark and mournful. You know, the church, the true church, mourns in an evil and a wicked world. It mourns for those that it knows. It mourns over the evil that's present constantly. Do you ever feel like it seems like you're carrying the load for other people's wickedness? There's a reason for that. Thou hast dove's eyes. Sad and mournful. But the Lord's looking in them. I want to get to that too. Looking in those dove's eyes. You know, a dove's eyes are only for its mate. We covered that, didn't we? How that a dove doesn't look for all the other doves around, but it's just looking for its mate. And the church is only looking for Christ. And Christ is only looking for His church. Everybody's not going to heaven with Christ. I mean, unless you count the judgment, going to the judgment seat, if you count that as going to heaven, then everybody's going to heaven. But everybody's not staying in heaven. Only the church. Christ has only eyes for His church. And the church only has eyes for Christ. But look, it says of that, has dove's eyes within thy locks. Within thy locks. He's talking about the hair upon the head of the church. Now remember that the Christ and the church are picture, or the husband and wife, I'm sorry, are picture of Christ and the church. So we hear when Solomon is speaking to this Shunammite woman about her locks and about her eyes within her locks. He's saying everything I just described about your eyes, everybody doesn't see. You've got to get past those locks of hair first. Those locks of hair mean something too. By the way, the rest of this verse makes more sense if you understand this. When it says, thy hair is as a flock of goats. Now that doesn't sound very romantic, does it? Not in today's world. Uh, go ahead, men, and tell your, tell your wife that, that her hair looks like a goat's and, and see how well that works for you. But you've got to understand the context of what was going on here. The goats at that time, when it speaks, and remember, we're talking about a shepherding community. Goats have very fine hair. These goats that it's speaking of up here uh, on Mount Gilead. Not like a, a sheep where there's a coarse hair to it. Very fine hair. He's speaking of the, how that this woman has very fine hair. Remember, you've got to look past those hair to get to that dove's eyes. And he's talking about the covering of a woman's hair. Remember how we talked about how that a woman's hair given for a covering represents that covering and protection of a man? He's saying that I see that you're covered and protected by my protection. And you know, if a woman has very fine hair, that means she's done some work on her hair probably. She's taken care of it, is what I mean. If she ignored it, it would be matted, it would be everything else that there is. But instead, she's taking care of it, has very fine hair. Listen, the church that Christ loved takes glory in the covering or protection that Christ has for it. Are you following me now? See, because that's what a woman's hair is. It's her covering. It shows that she's under a man's, not just subject to his authority, but subject to his protection as well. So Christ speaks of those long locks of hair that his church has. And the dove's eyes within those locks. 
within that protection. Yes, it speaks to, and to Him, that's a beauty. It's a beauty that's unsurpassed. To know that His church not only is protected by Him, but glories in His protection. Not in its own self, but glories in His protection. Has within it eyes only for Him. Sad and mournful and humble concerning the world around it, but only for Him. Did you know that Christ thought all those things about you? It's right there. His love for you is greater than I can describe. I really wish I had better words to describe it. But just like I told you, no man really knows how to describe to his woman how he loves her. I don't think that I know of any man who would really even know how to describe to the church how Christ loves the church. It's deeper than anything I've said. But He loves you that much. Loves you with a love that's greater than any love. And I think we're like the shoot on white woman sometimes. We say, I'm not fair. The sun's looked down on me. And I'm, I'm dark and I'm defiled by this world. And there's no reason. There's no reason for King Solomon to love me. There's no reason for Christ to love me. But remember, He said, Thou art fair, my love. Thou art fair. Said it twice. I think the first time is to get our attention and the second time is to remind us I'm, I'm for real about this. I really do love you. Don't let the cynicism of this world and the bitterness of this world take that away from you. If we really get a hold of that love that Christ has for us, I believe it lets us be able to, to overcome anything. It lets us overcome everything the world throws at us and those doubts within ourselves. Now, I'll ask you this, men. Have you ever wondered why in the world your woman just didn't seem to believe that you loved her? It's not that she doesn't believe, but those self-doubts are there. I wonder how it would be looking at it from Christ's side to see a church that just doesn't seem to want to believe that Christ loves him. He loves you. He loves you. And what he sees when he looks at you is not all of your infirmities. He doesn't look at you and see that like you look at yourself in the mirror. Because you know how we all are when we look and see ourselves in the mirror. We see every little freckle and wart and gray hair and everything else in the world, a wrinkle, it don't matter. We see all the things that are wrong. That's not what Christ is looking at when He looks at you. He sees dove's eyes within the locks of hair. He sees a beauty of holiness separate under Him, protected from this world, and for Him and for Him only. I just want you to take that home with you. I want you to think about that and dwell on that. Even throughout the week as you get an opportunity, think on that love that Christ has for you. All these little warts and freckles that you see on yourself, it's not what He's looking at. He's looking at what's inside you. Looking at that Spirit that's inside you. And He loves you. And I think you can make it through the week with that. I believe it's enough to make it. Make you able to make it through life with that, knowing that He loves you. I'm going to close it out there. It's Sunday night, and you hear what's going on outside. And uh, to my understanding, these line of storms coming through are pretty intense. So be careful driving home. And I guess stay home once you get home. It's liable to flood the streets. Be careful out there. Uh, and we'll see you Wednesday night. I'll ask Brother Don, would you close us out in a word of prayer? We'll see you tomorrow. Sorry for the revival. Brother Dom, would you close us out in a word of prayer?